We are nearly a month into Russia's war against Ukraine, and perhaps few cities look as much like war zones as Mariupol. Water is scarce, there's virtually no electricity or heat or gas, and most of the population is cut off from the outside world. Russia is demanding that Ukraine surrender Mariupol in exchange for safe passage out of the city. Lay down your arms, they said. This morning, Ukraine rejected that demand. Then, Russian forces hit an art school where around 400 people were hiding, mostly women and children. No word so far on how many were hurt or killed. A short time ago, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky appealed to all Ukrainians to, in his words, drive the occupiers out. He also directly addressed people on the southern city of Kherson. He says Russian forces there are targeting civilians. Today, CCTV footage appears to have captured some disturbing footage of Russian forces firing on protesters. Meanwhile, an attack in Kyiv last night destroyed a shopping mall. The strike appeared to be the most powerful explosion yet in the country's capital. Ukrainian officials say that it killed at least eight people. And shelling continues in other parts of Ukraine. That includes its second largest city, Kharkiv. Fair warning, some of the images in our first report tonight are disturbing. With that said, from our partners at Sky News, John Sparks starts us off. The streets of Kharkiv have been abandoned by the majority of those who live here. Half a million have fled this city, their prized possessions in a bag, and their cars discarded at the station. Those who remain hide in the shadows, in the dark, or the deep underground. More than a dozen metro stations have been turned into shelters. These battered-looking train carriages redeployed as home. How long have you been living here? Uh, three, 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 three weeks. weeks. How do you feel about it? So first, we are, when we hear something blow up, we run here, but now we're like, what was that? Oh, shooting. <laughs> The experience is a trial for a new mother called Natalia. She gave birth to her son two days after the invasion began. The hospital then sent her here. They now live in the final car on platform two, with a cot and clothes provided by volunteers. Natalia says life will never be the same again. Residents who remain will try to endure but some are no longer able. The city morgue receives 50 to 100 bodies a day caused by the war and by natural causes. But they don't have room to examine them here and they don't have the staff to bury them. The man in charge says it's a real struggle. When a Russian missile struck this institute, the entire neighborhood was damaged in the blast. 85-year-old Stella Ivanovna told us she hung on to the doorframe in the hope she'd survive. What was it like when the bombing happened, when the missile hit? One of her neighbors, called Diana, was not so fortunate. She was caught in the explosion, glass from the windows puncturing her face. Her doctor at Kharkiv's main hospital said there's a fine line between life and death. Next door, we found four men fighting for their lives. One hit by shrapnel, 
another blown up by a mine. Sergei is an opera singer turned volunteer who was shot seven times as he tried to evacuate local residents. Who was shooting at you? Sergei's body should heal in time, and he celebrated with an old Italian song of resistance. Death and displacement have come to everybody's doorstep, but there are many here who are determined to hold on. John Sparks, Sky News, Kharkiv. President Biden is heading to Europe this week. He's scheduled to attend the NATO summit in Brussels on Thursday. There, he plans to meet with allies and European Union officials to discuss support for Ukraine. Then on Friday, he goes to Poland, a key NATO ally, and he will meet with Polish President Andrzej Duda in Warsaw. Poland is just west of Ukraine. So far, it has taken in more than two million Ukrainian refugees. And that is where we find NBC's Dasha Burns joining us from Krakow, Poland, which is about 140 miles west of the Ukrainian border. Dasha, what do you see? Look, Joshua, so many people that come here, these refugees do not come here with much. But today we spent the day with a group that came here with even less. They had little to begin with. We uh, spent today with a group of 31 orphans who had to flee an orphanage in Ukraine. The director of that orphanage had the daunting task of getting this group of children across the border safely. Uh, he did so. And, you know, these kids are so resilient, Joshua. He told us that all along the way, a harrowing journey, they sang songs to keep their spirits up. Um, Ukraine has a large number of orphans, um, in part uh, due to issues like alcoholism. Many of these uh, ki kids are what they call social orphans. So some of them have parents who are uh, alive, but they are unable to take care of these children. And so they end up in these orphanages. And actually, in 2020, American families adopted more kids from Ukraine. Ukraine than any other country, Joshua. And so there are a lot of American families that actually have connections uh, to this country and its children. And the way we got in touch with this group of orphans was actually through a mom from Springfield, Missouri, who is here in Krakow right now uh, because she's been supporting an orphanage in Ukraine, this orphanage. And as soon as she realized that these kids might be in harm's way, she flew here. Um, she herself adopted a girl from Ukraine and became passionate about helping these kids and now just wants to make sure that uh, they are safe because these uh, are some of the most vulnerable uh, people caught up in this conflict. Today we met a young girl named Leah. She's 15 years old and she is one of these social orphans. She still has family in Ukraine even as she's now in Poland and that's what has her terrified right now. Take a listen to just a little bit of our conversation with Leah. The 5th of March is the last time you talked to your mom? Mm hmm Yes. Do you know where she is now? I don't know. How do you feel? I'm bad. She doesn't know if, if her mother is, is alive right now. Uh, all she can do is try to get some sense of normalcy here in Poland. Uh, Wendy Farrell, who is that Missouri mom I mentioned, she is hoping to uh, get these 31 orphans into the U.S. where they can, ha can have a more sustainable place to stay until uh, it's safe enough to return to Ukraine. Because right now, more and more refugees continue to come into Poland, uh, and they're hoping to, to be able to find a space that they can actually uh, stay a little bit more long term as it's unclear uh, when we'll see an end to this conflict, Joshua. Dasha, we mentioned that President Biden is planning to go to Poland to meet up with Polish President Duda, that we've been told by the United Nations that more than two million people have fled from Ukraine into Poland. What do we know about what's on President Biden's agenda for his trip there? 
Well, look, this is a massive uh, movement of people, right? It is incredibly historic just how many millions of folks are displaced right now. And, you know, here in Poland, everywhere you look, you hear a story of everyday people putting their lives on hold to help people who had to leave their lives behind. And they're all asking for more resources. They're asking for more from the United States. Uh, we expect Biden to um, be at the NATO summit. He is going to meet with the, the president here in Poland, though we uh, have heard from the White House press secretary that there are no plans for the president to cross the border into Ukraine. Uh, but I'll tell you, as you walk the streets here in Poland just last night. We were in the town square here in Krakow, and there was a small demonstration with a, a couple dozen folks holding up signs that say, close the skies. Um, that is a sign you'll see in a lot of storefronts here. People want the United States to take more action. They um, hear the messages of support, but they still feel like there's more lip service um, than action. And a, a lot of people here, like I said, have given up a lot uh, of time and, and a lot of their lives and their jobs jobs uh, in order to to do something about this. So they're hoping uh, to see more uh, from from this visit. Thank you, Dasha. Much appreciated. That's NBC's Dasha Burns reporting from Krakow, Poland tonight. Most Ukrainians are still within the country's borders, as best we know. Many are internally displaced after escaping their hometowns. Thousands have traveled west toward the city of Lviv, but some have taken shelter in the Carpathian Mountains. Those are in southwestern Ukraine. This region has sheltered Ukrainians many times in its history. NBC's Molly Hunter takes us there. There are no explosions here, not even any air raid sirens, and even with this sound, so rare these days, Nowhere in Ukraine feels completely safe. We uh, have this feeling now that it was a nightmare, that it didn't really happen. That it just feels completely Completely fake. unreal, yeah. Even imagine it, it's, it's, it's difficult. Because when, we, uh, when I was living through it first five days, yeah. it felt like, well, okay, it's war. For me, I, I really do have hard times to believe that our neighbor could actually do this. I mean, it's 21st century. There are other means for people to solve their problems. They have mouths, they can talk. But it's really, it, it's hard to believe. We have to leave all we have and to move. And we are refugees now. 38-year-old Oksana, her husband Eugene, and their girls, four-year-old Marta and five-year-old Kira, fled from Irpin two weeks ago. How are the girls doing? And they are fine. We are a Russian-speaking family. The one, the most traumatic question I had from my kid is why Russians try to kill us. <laughs> and I really don't understand why they want to kill us. Right, you don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah, I don't have an answer. The mountain village of Volovets is about 7,000 people, but no one knows how many people have evacuated here. Some say several thousand. Oksana and Eugene estimate closer to 12,000. For centuries, the Carpathian Mountains have been a refuge for people fleeing war. No army in history has been able to take and hold this rocky terrain. Well, here in Volovets, the people who live here are descendants of the generations of refugees before them. And history is repeating itself. People are now opening their doors to the newest arrivals. Villagers here descend from previous generations of refugees, Jews fleeing persecution, Ukrainians during both world wars. It is the refuge from war. Yeah, it's not the, our first time we are uh, we uh, uh, take or have refugees. Helena Yavorska is an English teacher here at the main school. She shows us where the school kitchen is cranking out hundreds of meals a day and the classrooms turn dormitories. But people from the East yeah. who don't necessarily want to go to Lviv, who don't want to leave the country, are coming yeah, here. Yeah, they are the coming Carpathian here because Mountains. they know that we will help them and they have safe place and they can, uh, even those who have nothing, they uh, may have homes and uh, food and everything they need. She then takes us up to the train station. Her students are handing out food to passing trains coming from hard hit eastern cities. They're the school leaders, she says, 16, 17 years old, 
This was their last year of high school, and even sheltered in this safe haven, their lives too have been put on hold, and graduation this year would have to wait. They were buying even dresses, their um, nice uh, dresses for their final. For graduation. Uh, graduation, yeah. For their party, graduation party. But uh, now I don't know what they all do no. with their dresses. <laughs> you've, already, you've already bought dresses for graduation? <laughs> For now, everyone is doing their part, and Oksana says she feels that. Well, I mean, we are blessed to meet these people because they're really nice. Nice for us, like, like you came to your mother's house. <laughs> that welcoming, just kind of open arms. Yeah, open arms. They, they keep on uh, making food for us, caring for us and stuff. So people are very nice here. We meet Oksana again over dinner. And she tells us she spent her junior year of high school abroad in Orlando, Florida, and how concerned her host mother is. And she was texting me all the time since the beginning of uh, January because we hear news that the war is about to start. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't believe that. I said, I was like, nothing will start. Maybe there will be some economical problems, but it's impossible for the war to start yeah. here. There's no way. Now, between Ukraine and Russia. Would you go to the States? If you can? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because I have, like, the best memories of my life from States because it was, you know, a remarkable year. After dinner, we called Diane Levine Rivers in Florida. I can't imagine. I mean, I'm sure, you know, it, it's just, I can't even imagine, you know, that she didn't know she's going to live or die, you know. It's like a daughter to me. But now since the war started, I'm very concerned and I wanted to see her, you know, in a safe place, which I know that she is now. And that's the plan, at least for now. Do you think you guys will just all stay here? We'll see. For now, we are like, you know, we live on our suitcases. We never know what's going to be next. Maybe tomorrow they will have another another shift of negotiations. <laughs> we don't really believe in it, but still, I mean, we hope. But like so many before them, hiding out here, a fortress built by nature, a place that feels a little like home. Molly Hunter, NBC News, Volovets, Ukraine. This war keeps raising more questions every day. For us, maybe for you too. We answered a lot of your questions on Friday night. You'll find that video if you just search for us on social media. We are at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. If you have more questions about Ukraine, about Russia, about this war, or about the world's response to it, leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or you can email us now tonight at NBCnews.com. Many countries are punishing Russia for invading Ukraine. Still to come, we'll dig into more official ways of condemning the Russian government. One idea, designating it a state sponsor of terrorism. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. The images from the war in Ukraine are devastating. A maternity ward and children's hospital bombed in Mariupol. A theater that was bombed despite having been marked as having children inside. And many other attacks on civilian infrastructure. That's leading some to argue that the United States should designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. Now this might or might not match what you think of when you think of terrorism. Atrocities, war crimes, yes, but state-sponsored terrorism? Well, the U.S. government says that's when a country provides support for acts of international terrorism. And the FBI says international terrorism involves, quote, violent criminal acts committed by individuals and or groups who are inspired by or associated with designated foreign terrorist organizations or nations, unquote. Right now, the U.S. has these four state sponsors of terrorism named, Syria, Iran, North Korea, more recently Cuba, and that subjects them to sanctions, including restrictions on U.S. foreign aid and a ban on defense exports and sales. So, does Russia meet this definition? And if so, what difference would the designation make? Let's get into that with Bobby Ghosh, a columnist covering foreign affairs for Bloomberg Opinion. Mr. Ghosh, welcome. 
Hi, George. So does that definition ring true for you in terms of a state sponsor of terrorism? Well, yes, but that, the, it rings true because the definition is so vague. It's so the, the, the idea of a state sponsor of terrorism is so loosely defined by the U.S. State Department that you could apply it to a number of countries. If, is Russia sponsoring terrorism? Absolutely it is. But is Pakistan? Absolutely. And Pakistan has for decades. How come Pakistan is not designated? So the trouble we have now is that the, we, we, as a country, seem to apply this very selectively um, when it suits us, when there's a lot of emotion attached, as it is right now. This would be a good moment, I think, for the United States to step back, take a close look at that definition, put some more meat on the bones of that idea, and, and be clearer about what constitutes a state sponsor of terrorism, um, and then what we're going to do about it once we designate a country. There's a lot of talk right now in terms of what we call Russia, whether it has to do with war crimes. The International Criminal Court has said it's begun collecting evidence yeah. for a possible war crime uh, prosecution that may take place down the road. Now this conversation about state sponsor of terrorism. I wonder how much of this is about just the, the rhetorical optics of what we say about what's happening in Russia. You've heard a lot of world leaders going to great pains to kind of share a very unified message in terms of what much of the Western world feels about what's happening in Ukraine. Well, uh, certainly a lot of it is optics. Certainly a lot of it is emotion. We're looking at these images over and over again. You showed, it, you showed some of them uh, earlier in the segment of, of horrors being perpetrated on what we can tell are innocent civilian women, children, pregnant women. Um, these are clearly horrifying. These are, these are clearly designed to terrorize a population. Now, we can argue that this has been true of war throughout history, going back to Alexander the Great right. and, and even further be, beyond that, perhaps uh, since the beginning of war as a concept, that attacking armies have tried to terrorize countries, which means terrorize civilians, into surrender. But now we have these definitions of terrorism, um, and the State Department has had one for many years. And as I was saying, these are not clear enough, and we have not been consistent enough. So suppose that this does happen, right? Yeah. And we have no indication that this is likely or this is, yeah. is imminent or whatever. But look, just for the sake of conversation, suppose the U.S. does designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. What happens then? I, I almost feel like this is a similar issue with designating Vladimir Putin as a war criminal. We had one of our viewers who asked, okay, so you call him a war criminal, who's going to go arrest Vladimir Putin? Like, I'm just not sure what the next move would be. Yeah, so now, as you pointed out, there, there are very specific sanctions that are applied. If we designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism, we can't sell them defense uh, equipment. They're not buying our defense equipment. We can't sell them what are called dual-use equipment. Equipment can be used for defense as well as for civilian use. They don't buy a hell of, hell of a lot of those. Um, we can't give them uh, grants and aid. They don't really need grants and aid from us. There are specific financial sanctions which can bite. But guess what? We've got a ton of financial sanctions on Russia anyway. So it feels like designating them a terrorist sponsor would not greatly move the needle. And here's the big question. Would it change their behavior? Has it changed the behavior of other countries who've been... I mean, Cuba has been designated for decades. It hasn't changed their behavior. Syria, Iran, North Korea hasn't changed their behavior. So we also need to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of these designations? Do they actually move the needle with the countries? Now, we're in a position where the whole world, practically the whole world, now regards Russia as a pariah. So the objective, I would argue, of this designation has already been achieved. Um, putting an, a dot on the I or a cross on the T, I'm not sure that helps a great deal. Before I have to let you go, I wonder what you think the next most impactful thing is that we could do. It feels like a lot of people including the American people, let alone an attack on a NATO country, right? Because the polling shows that the American people, broadly speaking, would be very strongly in favor of the U.S. honoring its NATO obligations to protect NATO countries who are attacked. But absent that, what do you think is the next most impactful thing that we can do to send a message to Russia about what's happening in Ukraine? Before we go. Well, they're already the most sanctioned country in the world. 
We've already put more, we and our allies have put more sanctions on Russia than on Iran, on Cuba, on Syria. It's the most sanctioned country in the world. So we're, we're quite far down the road with that. Um, we are arming the Ukrainians with more and more powerful weapons, short of giving them aircraft. We're now give, offering, I understand that the Biden administration has considered giving the Ukrainians um, anti-aircraft missiles, uh, missile defense systems. That represents a, a sort of a notch up in the kind of um, weaponry that we've provided. Um, and basically, we're trying our best to, to, to get the Chinese on side against the Russians. That, if Biden's uh, conversation with Xi Jinping last week, if that moves the needle at all, if we can get the Chinese to move even a little bit and begin to criticize the Russians more, I think that would have far greater impact than sponsorship designation, more sanctions, anything else we could do. Bobby Ghosh with Bloomberg Opinion. And we did have a conversation about China's role in all of this. You can find that conversation at NBC Now tonight. Mr. Ghosh, thanks very much. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Up next, we'll shift gears to the Supreme Court. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson sat quietly for most of today's hearings, but the senators begin questioning her tomorrow. We'll have a preview. And later, an update on that plane crash in China. 132 people were aboard. That's all just ahead. Stay close. The Supreme Court confirmation hearings for Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson are underway. Today, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee gave their opening statements. Judge Jackson could become the first black woman on the Supreme Court. In her opening statement, she thanked her family, her colleagues, and God for getting her this far. If I am confirmed, I commit to you that I will work productively to support and defend the Constitution and this grand experiment of American democracy that has endured over these past 246 years. This is Judge Jackson's fourth time in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, whose members you see here. The last time was for her current job on the D.C. Circuit Appeals Court. Tomorrow, all 22 committee members will get 30 minutes each to question her. They also have the option of another 20 minutes after that. Expect a very, very long day. Republicans gave a glimpse of what they might ask about. Today, some GOP senators mentioned Judge Jackson's time defending Guantanamo Bay detainees as a public defender, as well as her history with sentencing. Senate Democrats spent the day focusing on her credentials and praising her historic nomination. In every case, in each of these seven, Judge Jackson handed down a lenient sentence that was below what the federal guidelines recommended and below what prosecutors requested. I'm likely to be followed by one or more colleagues who have raised allegations about your record that are simply unfounded in fact and indeed irresponsible. They're unproven and unprovable. Joining us now is NPR legal affairs correspondent Nina Totenberg. Nina, it's good to see you again. And I wonder if we could start with one other thing that Judge Jackson said today in her opening statement, something that I think tries to get at some of the questions that she will face tomorrow. Here's part of the judge's opening. Listen. I know that my role as a judge is a limited one, that the Constitution empowers me only to decide cases and controversies that are properly presented. And I know that my judicial role is further constrained by careful adherence to precedent. Nina, one of the things that came up a lot, at least among some of the senators, was her judicial philosophy. And it sounds like she was kind of beginning to lay that out in her opening statement today. What kind of questioning do we expect in terms of sussing out what her philosophies are? Well, in her confirmation hearing for the Court of Appeals, which is less than a year ago, uh, a lot of the senators asked her her judicial philosophy. And she said, you know, I basically don't have one entirely because I'm a lower court judge and I'm constrained by what the Court of Appeals, when she was a district court judge, and the Supreme Court tell me I have to do. And now some of her conservative critics have called that evasive, but you know, the, the judicial nominees, the Trump nominees, the Obama nominees were well-schooled in 
saying as little as possible, as elegantly as possible, and I suspect that this <laughs> nominee will be no different. There was some polling in terms of Judge Jackson. Monmouth University found that about half of people said that they believed Judge Jackson was either very or somewhat qualified for the role. Over half said she should be confirmed. Just about a fifth of people who were asked said that she should not be confirmed. Talk about what you think might make the biggest difference in terms of her confirmation. A lot's been made about the historic nature of it, but what do you think is ultimately going to make the difference here? Well, you know, I think that the question of her qualifications has already been answered. And you didn't see any member of the Judiciary Committee today, including some who promised to be some rather severe critics of her tenure on the lower courts. Uh, even those don't dispute that she is highly qualified in terms of education, in terms of judicial background, a background as a public defender, background in as uh, the vice chairman of the Sentencing Commission for four years. All of those things make it really hard to claim that she's not qualified. If you want to vote against her because you think she's too liberal, I suspect there will be people who will make that argument. But because she serves on a court that deals mainly with very arcane questions of the administrative state, she has not actually weighed in on a great many issues. And that makes her, as one of her defenders puts it, almost genetically perfect in the sense that it's very difficult to attack her. She hasn't weighed in on most of the hot button issues of the day, uh, including the ones that are currently before the Supreme Court, uh, the right to bear arms, uh, abortion rights, uh, in, and even religious rights, and the ones that are set for next year, affirmative action and more religious rights. So they can ask her whether she should recuse herself because at one time, and it's not clear how this all overlaps, but she is, was until recently a member of the Harvard University Board of Overseers. And Harvard University is one of the... Um, targets of an affirmative action challenge that's being brought against Harvard and University of North Carolina as well. So right. they may ask her if she'll recuse herself, but beyond that, it's really hard to look at her judicial record and say, well, gee, I see somebody who's really has laid out a very clear record in terms of her philosophy, because I'm not sure that she has. What's your sense of what the Senate is looking for from the next justice? Are they looking for someone who can be another Justice Stephen Breyer? Not that there will ever be another Justice Breyer. He's a very unique individual, but someone kind of in that vein. I mean, that's what was discussed, is that she clerked for him, and they feel that she's very much in that same kind of line of judicial philosophy. But then there's also going to be, as you mentioned, some conversation about some very hot-button issues. I know the AP did a fact check not too long ago about uh, prosecutions of cases related to child pornography and how that might come up. What is your sense of what the Senate is looking for these days in a justice, especially someone to fill the very august shoes of Justice Stephen Breyer? Well, the president is looking for somebody who reflects what he hopes she will do on the court. And the Republicans are worried about what they fear she might do on the court, but neither knows for sure. And there are always some surprises. Let me remind you, for example, that Justice Gorsuch, who was one of the Trump appointees, wrote the opinion upholding uh, the notion that, um, that the Civil Rights in Employment Act passed in the 1960s applies to gay employees and trans employees. And that was definitely a disappointment to his supporters. So nobody is gonna please everybody all of the time. We can only say that I think with, without fear of contradiction, that the Democrats want to help her be unscathed and some of the conservative Republicans would like to brush her up a little bit. And, but until, until and unless there is something rather unexpected, because the court is already a six to three conservative supermajority, 
It's right. very unlikely that this nominee, the, who would be the first black woman to serve on the court and would be one of four women, which is a record number, who would, if she's confirmed, be sitting on the court. It's very unlikely that she will not win confirmation. Well, we will have coverage of those hearings tomorrow throughout the day here on N NBC News Now. NPR Legal Affairs correspondent Nina Totenberg. Nina, it's good to see you again. Thank you very much. Nice to see you, Joshua. Now, before Judge Jackson gave her opening statement, she received two introductions from supporters. That's common at Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Professor Lisa Fairfax teaches law at the University of Pennsylvania. She was Judge Jackson's roommate at Harvard. Even though we are the same age, she is the role model who makes you believe in what she said. You can do it, and here's how. And she showed us how. By the power of her example of hard work, preparation, and excellence that transforms the seemingly impossible into the achievable. And that may be the heart of what has some folks rooting for Judge Jackson. The seemingly impossible, now perhaps achievable task of making the Supreme Court look more like America. My initial reaction of her nomination is just excitement and joy. Having a black woman on the Supreme Court, that messaging alone is, is priceless. I think black women are very excited. It's been a long time that they've been waiting for a nomination like this, and what a nominee. I am truly humbled by the extraordinary honor of this nomination. She has all of the qualifications, academic, she has the legal acumen, you know, local girl done good. Harvard certainly had its share of very smart women and smart men, but Judge Jackson took it to a different level. She brings trial court and appellate court experience and then also sentencing experience. We've never had a public defender, so that by itself is notable. So she brings a lot to the table beyond the race and gender diversity that has been much the topic of conversation around her nomination. For too long, our government, our courts haven't looked like America. But all eyes are will be on her because she is the first. She will be the first if confirmed on that court. First African-American woman. The hardest part is if you make a mistake, that it is based on your being a woman. It is based on you being black. It is based on anything except the legitimacy of perhaps we have a different perspective of how a result should be reached. Somehow people were looking at me as a representative sample as to, you know, can she make it? We come to places like Harvard Law School and these top law schools and we're told that there is no you know, ceiling, so to speak, for your profession, but you don't see that. It is an amazing signal to all of the young Black women lawyers who are in law school now, who are going to go to law school, that this is attainable, that this really durable glass ceiling has finally been shattered. When I was a student at Harvard Law, there were certainly people who said that we were going places in life and there may be a Supreme Court justice among us. I never thought it would be a black woman because we've never had that before. And I'm joyful because the representation that we seek as judges of color, as black judges, seems to truly be at a point where we're going to be included. I had no idea that I would ever become a judge. But now to see someone who looks like me even ascend to the highest court of the land, I, you know, I think back and, oh my goodness, I'm just grateful. I feel like she's taking all of us with her. Oh, seeing is believing. I feel motivated to to do more and to be more and to give more and to challenge the assumptions that I've already made about myself and how far I can get in this legal profession based on my background. I feel good. Just a few of the people who are cheering on Judge Jackson. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court is at work right now, but without one justice in person. Justice Clarence Thomas is in the hospital with flu-like symptoms. A statement from the court says he does not, not, have COVID, but... The 73-year-old justice was admitted to a Washington, D.C. hospital on Friday night. He's been receiving antibiotics to treat an infection. The court also says Justice Thomas's symptoms were improving and he could be released in the next few days. 
Justice Thomas will catch up on cases with briefs, transcripts, and virtual oral arguments. Let's get to some of today's other headlines. The Biden administration is formally accusing Myanmar of genocide against its Rohingya minority. Since 2017, the Myanmar military's attacks have forced more than 700,000 Rohingya to seek refuge in Bangladesh. The refugees have accused Myanmar's military of murder, rape, and torture. The military denies this. Today, Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. I've spoken today about the path to genocide. But let me close by saying something about the path out of genocide. Today's determination is one step on that path. As it tells Rohingya, and victims in particular, that the United States government recognizes the gravity of the atrocities committed against them. And it reaffirms Rohingya's human rights and dignity, something the Burmese military has tried to destroy. In China, a rescue team is searching for the wreckage of a plane. It crashed in the Guangxi region in southern China. The plane was operated by China Eastern Airlines, and it had 132 souls aboard, including nine crew members. Boeing was the manufacturer of the plane. In a statement, the company has offered its full support to the investigation led by the Civil Aviation Administration of China. NBC Aviation correspondent Tom Costello has more. Hey, Tom. Hey, Joshua, good evening. So this is a very concerning plane crash. It was, as you mentioned, China Eastern 5735, a domestic flight in China with about 132 people on board, and it appears that there were no survivors. Investigators are very concerned by the flight radar 24 data, which suggests that the plane literally went down uh, in a nosedive from 29,000 feet cruising altitude all the way down to the ground. At one point, when it was at about 7,400 feet, it suddenly started climbing again and then again went down and hit the ground. Uh, there is video that state uh, TV in China has run suggesting the same thing, that in fact it did go straight into the ground, not at, in any way was it in a normal flight configuration. So as they know that there are no survivors, it appears anyway there are no survivors, they're looking now through the wreckage, hoping to get enough of the wreckage to get some clues as to what happened. And the black boxes here will be critical. The flight data recorder, which will analyze a thousand points of data for the plane, and the cockpit voice recorder, which literally records every conversation between the pilots, but also picks up all of the audio inside the cockpit, the alarms going off, the warnings going off. So all of that will help them uh, Tell, uh, help them paint the picture of what happened on board this flight. It's critical because this was a 737-800. It was not a Boeing 737 MAX. It was an 800, which is very widely flown. 5,000 planes worldwide, hundreds in the United States. Chances are, if you've flown at all in the last few years, you've been on a 737-800. It has a very good track record. So trying to determine what brought this plane down in China so, uh, so unexpectedly and in such a dramatic fashion is a high priority for the Chinese investigators and the NTSB and Boeing. Boeing and the NTSB would be parties to the investigation if the Chinese allow them in. It's always up to the, the nation that where the crash occurred to decide whether these other parties to the investigation can also join. But it is a high priority case with so many Boeing 737-800s flying around the world. Uh, Joshua, back to you. Thank you, Tom. That's NBC aviation correspondent Tom Costello reporting for us tonight. Spring break is in full swing after two years of COVID, but in the city of Miami Beach, a few folks are apparently partying way too hard because today its mayor declared a state of emergency. You know, our city is well past its end point. What we're watching and what we're feeling and what we're observing is simply unacceptable at every level. Miami Beach shut down part of Ocean Drive after a weekend swarm of partygoers. I'm from South Florida, but I can't say I've seen anything like that before. But police also say that five people have been shot there in the past two days. Now, I'm, Miami Beach did have a midnight curfew in effect from Thursday morning through the weekend. Meanwhile, many more people are flying or driving for spring break. TSA says travel is well above last year's numbers, and AAA says road trips are back up to pre-pandemic levels. 
If you have spring break travel plans, we would love to know what's on your agenda. So tell us your story. We are at NBC Now tonight on social media. Leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. Remember to join us early for Judge Jackson's confirmation hearings, but until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson on my last night as a 41-year-old. Thanks for making time for us. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.